Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. You're watching Culturally Determined, and I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade. And my guest today is David Grand. Uh, David, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm David Grand. I'm a staff writer at the New Yorker magazine, and I'm the author of a few books, The Lost City of Z, um, The Devil and Sherlock Holmes, a collection of my New Yorker stories. And my newest book is Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders, and the Birth of the FBI. Right, so I'm, I have a copy. <laughs> I have a copy right here. Um, bought it with my own money. Um, so thanks so much for coming on. You're one of my favorite uh, nonfiction authors writing today. So I'm very excited to talk to you. And here's your new book, Killers of the Flower Moon. Thanks so um, much. So could, for people, this is, book has gotten a lot of press, a lot of great reviews. For people who haven't heard about it yet, could you offer kind of a brief synopsis of what the book is about? Sure. Um, the book is about the Osage Indians of Oklahoma, who in the 19, well, early, the early 20th century had become the wealthiest people per capita in the world uh, because of oil deposits under their land. And then they began to be uh, mysteriously murdered one by one in really what was one of the most sinister crimes in American history. And the case became um, one of the FBI's first major homicide investigations and one of the first uh, major homicide investigations uh, when J. Edgar Hoover was director of the Bureau. Right. So the, the subtitle is The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. Um, so, like, if people who haven't read your stuff, the, the way I think about your writing is it's like fiction, but except it's all real. And <laughs> you find these incredible stories that seem too good to be true, but they are true. So this, this book, which I, which I highly recommend uh, everyone pick up and your other books, Less City Z, uh, especially is, are, are great. Um, and they have t your books, your, the stories you find have these crazy twists in them that seem incredible. So I, I don't want to give too much away. You probably don't either for people who want, who are interested in reading the book, but um, can you tell us how you, you found the story? Yeah. So, um, you know, I always say it's, I, I find the hardest process of reporting and writing is finding the right story. I find that the most challenging, uh, the most time consuming. Um, and I kind of go through processes of reading lots of newspapers and I also cold call people. Um, and in this case, I actually cold called somebody. I had uh, read somewhere that the FBI had its own historian, institutional historian. And I thought, oh, that's so curious. And so I picked up the phone and I called this historian and I introduced myself. I said, my name is David Gran and I'm a writer with The New Yorker. And I was hoping just to chat with you about maybe possibly interesting cases um, that the Bureau had dealt with. And we chatted for a while um, and he mentioned some more recent cases. And towards the very end of our conversation, he mentioned and there was this old case about the uh, Osage murders that the Bureau was involved with that. Um, he didn't know that much about it, hadn't been written much about. Um, and that's what kind of tipped me off to it. And then I went out to um, Osage Territory uh, in Oklahoma. Um, not long after that, I began to do research. And uh, I visited the Osage Nation Museum. And when I was there, they had this great panoramic photograph. You can actually see it on the title page of the book. Um, and it was taken in 1924. And it showed um, members of the Osage Nation along with white settlers, and it looked very innocent, mm -hmm. but a portion of the photograph had been cut out. And I asked the, the museum director what had happened to the missing panel, um, and she said it had contained a figure so frightening she decided to remove it. And she then pointed to the missing panel, and she said the devil was standing right there. And the book really grew out of trying to understand who that figure was, who was one of the killers of the Osage, and the anguishing history he embodied. Mm -hmm. So we won't reveal who that is for people who want to get the, kind of the real life mystery um, told told by you in the book. Why do you, this is a, a, just an incredible story? Why do you think it, it was kind of forgotten by history? For something that was, is so unusual. This a series of murders of um, American Indians. Yeah, I mean, I think um, early on Hoover um, trumpeted the case, at least the bureau's role in the case. Um, and to try to kind of mythologize himself. Uh, but then came the 30s um, and the kind of war with the public enemies and Dillinger and um, uh, Machine Gun Kelly, and they began to kind of overshadow this case. But I think even on a more deep or profound level, uh, these crimes were neglected for many, many 
uh, years, and they went on for many years because of prejudice, because the victims were Native Americans. And while the Osage were deeply intimate and familiar with this history, um, I think these stories were often neglected by historians uh, outside the tribe uh, because of the prejudice or because these stories were marginalized and they didn't kind of enter into the mainstream. And again, that's just my supposition. There's no way to know for sure. But it does not really make sense that a case that is one of the most really chilling conspiracies uh, in American history would not be part of our school books and something we all read about. Mm -hmm. So one of the most bizarre um, aspects of this story that you described that I knew nothing about was the, uh, the guardianship system. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. So, um, so the Osage became extraordinarily wealthy uh, because of the oil money under their land. Um, each one of them, there was only about 2000 or so had what was basically it was called a head right, which was essentially a share in the mineral trust. And if you had a head right, you would receive uh, a quarterly check. And over time, as the Osage money increased, those checks became worth more and more money. And by the 1920s, these 2,000 or so Osage on the tribal roll were receiving millions and millions of dollars. In 1923, in that year alone, the Osage received what would be worth today more than $400 million dollars. Um, and they really, they were considered the wealthiest people per capita in the world. They lived in mansions. Uh, they had, uh, servants, many of whom were white. This belied long-standing stereotypes of Native Americans. Um, and this provoked all sorts of strange reactions across the country, um, including this guardianship system, which gets to your question. So because of prejudice, the Osage were scapegoated. So it's important to understand that this is the 1920s, the era of the Great Gatsby. Um, you know, we're, we're an era of prolificacy, but somehow members of the U.S. Congress would hold hearings to say, what are we going to do about these Native Americans, these Osage, with all their oil money? And they went so far as to pass legislation requiring uh, many Osage to have guardians. Uh, and this system was quite literally racist. It wasn't even abstractly racist. It was based on the quantum of Osage blood. So if you were a full-blooded Osage, you were deemed, quote-unquote, incompetent, and you were given a guardian to manage your fortunes. So here you could be a great uh, Osage chief um, with millions of dollars in your trust, and yet you could have a white set there telling you which car to purchase or whether you could get this soap at the corner store. And not only was the system racist, it really created one of the largest state and federally sanctioned criminal enterprises as many guardians went on to swindle millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible that this happened in, you know, in America in the 20th century. Or maybe, I don't know, given our history, maybe not so incredible. But it is, it is, I mean, you know, one should never be shocked by prejudice and the depths in which it's existed uh, in our history and the history of other countries. But it is, what is remarkable is this story is a microcosm of so many of the forces that played out in this country and the clash of Native American civilization and white settlers. Um, but it is quite remarkable that this is playing out in the 1920s. It is not that long ago. We're not talking about the colonial era uh, when this is taking place. Mm -hmm. So in this book and in Lost City of Z, which I once again highly recommend to all of our viewers if they haven't uh, read it yet, it's a great, a great book, you are talking about um, people who lived 100 years ago or so or more um, but you managed to really bring an immediacy to their lives and present them almost as though you had interviewed them yourself. Yourself. What, what is? How do you manage to pull that off? <laughs> is is there? Yeah. It, it, what do you it's do? The, it's the hardest. I mean, I, I said the hardest part is finding the idea. Uh, I think that's the most challenging. Um, to find the right story or the right um, part of history to excavate. Um, but in a story like this, it really was challenging to try to um, record their voices, um, the voices of the victims, the voices of the murderers, um, uh, and, and to get those stories. And, and the process really took me much longer than anything else I had worked on. It took me close to five years to write and research the book. Wow. Wow. Um, but I was fortunate in several regards. Um, it was time consuming, but... There were multiple investigations into these crimes. There were private detectives. 
There were state investigations at times. There were multiple federal investigations at times. Um, and so because of that, there was an enormous amount of reports and there were multiple uh, trials at certain points. And so many of the people who participated were interviewed many, many times. Um, but one of the more fortunate things I found was uh, the grand jury testimony, uh, the secret grand jury testimony, which to the best of my knowledge had never been made public. I just found it in a folder kind of miscatalogued uh, in the archives out of Fort Worth and uh -huh. part of the National Archives. And what was very useful and helpful about that is because unlike just court transcripts where often people say yes or no, there people would give full long answers and you could hear their voice, you could hear their diction, you could hear how they spoke. You got a much better sense of who they were. Um, and so that was very helpful. Um, and then another part of the process um, was tracking down descendants of both the murderers and the victims to see what kind of records they may have, were there letters, were there diaries, was there correspondence, um, were there any memoirs or unpublished reports. Um, and they were an extra um, very helpful a bit of information, and then also they had oral histories, and 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 there was even a case. Um, sadly, she has passed, but um, where I was able to interview a descendant who knew actually was alive at the time, a little girl, and then knew many of the people involved, and so that was extremely helpful as well. Mm -hmm. um, I read in one of the interviews you did about the book that you had a lot of trouble with the structure, and were ultimately inspired by Absalom, Absalom, William Faulkner's novel and how you put it together. I have to ask about this as a re recovering English major. Um, <laughs> can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, I found um, this story um, very challenging because um, it, it spanned many years. There are many, many crimes. There are many victims. There were multiple investigations. There were multiple investigators. And I wanted to try to wet, find a way to make this history kind of intimate. So that, you know, in things I would read about the cases, many of the people were just a sentence. The victims often were given no agency. You didn't get a sense of who they were. Um, and so I couldn't early on figure out quite how to tell the story because there were just so many people involved. Like, I couldn't really manage the material. And I was so, in fact, befuddled that there was a period where I didn't know how – I. I I wouldn't say I had abandoned the project, but I didn't think I could do it because uh -huh. I really was trying to find a way uh, to tell narrative history. And I just happened to be reading Absalom and Absalom, which I actually, there was an article in the New York Times Magazine that, about it. And I was like, well, I never read that novel. Uh, so I started reading it. And I think it's just more a reflection of how the brain can work in kind of mysterious ways. And often, it's when you're not consciously trying to solve a problem where the problems can be solved. And so when I was reading that novel, it has multiple narrators. It has three narrators. Um, and it's really about kind of the elusiveness of oral history. In many ways, it's one of its themes. Um, and so it occurred to me this idea of three narrators uh, which is not something I had really done in history. Usually you kind of just tell it from omniscience or you tell it from one point of view, mm -hmm. um, would really let me control the material. And so I decided to tell the book structured it, uh, from the point of view of three narrators. One of the narrators is Molly Burkhart, an Osage woman who's at the center of the conspiracy and her family's being targeted. And then uh, the second chronicle is told from the point of view of uh, an evidence man, an FBI agent. And that let me kind of control the information around one investigator and what it was like for him, as opposed to so many investigators where you would just be confused and different investigations. And then the final part, and this um, allowed me to solve other problems, which was um, I do the third chronicle for the present, from my point of view, of kind of sifting through these records and interviewing um, descendants today. And it let me fill in the gaps. And, and one of the themes of the books is the kind of elusiveness of history uh -huh. and how difficult it is often to ascertain the truth. And so it's often only with time, uh, with more perspective, more information, that we get a fuller portrait of what really happened. So that's a very long answer to your question, but um, it, it was a way to solve many problems, that structure. And let me really tell the story. And when I came up with that, it felt very true to the material. I think it's always important 
that the material itself offers a structure, and I thought that structure was very organic to the material I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. So without, once again, giving too much away, in the last section, which is you, it's called The Reporter, and it's you uh, talking about current day events, you uncover new information about one of these um, murders. Can you talk a little bit more about that part of the of the story? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the, the and I think it's fair to say for you know that the the bureau was ultimately able to capture a few of the killers, and um, but then the case was prematurely closed. And over time, as I interviewed Osage and I spent time in the archives. I began to get a sense that there really was a much deeper and darker conspiracy that the Bureau never exposed. There were many, many more murders, perhaps, you know, scores and perhaps even hundreds that went unsolved. And so in my section, I tried to track down evidence in several of these cases to try to illuminate them. Uh, and I think one of the cases you're referring to um, is the story uh, I tracked down descendants of a lawyer who was thrown off a speeding train. He was somebody who, who back in the 1920s had gathered evidence and was trying to catch the killers. And because of that, uh, he was thrown off a speeding train. But nobody ever specifically identified who the killers were. And the descendants, when I met with them, had long lived with the ambiguity and kind of the haunting gaps in their knowledge, not knowing precisely what had happened. And I began to look into that case, and I gathered... You know, initially, I didn't think I would find anything. Um, and then to my surprise, going through archives, finding court records, there was a large amount of circumstantial evidence that pinpointed um, the most likely suspect. I think the evidence is very strong, indicating that this person was responsible. He was even on the train at the time. And then I even found uh, a record from an informant who separately identified uh, this man as the killer and one of the accomplices. Now, I try to be careful in the book that, you know, in dealing with these cases where there were cover ups and, um, and investigating them nearly a century later, the witnesses and the suspects are often dead. And so you can't interrogate them. And I try to be as respectful and fear to these people who can no longer speak or defend themselves. But I did think the evidence was, was quite striking and quite overwhelming. And there was a point where I actually called the descendant who had initially, um, I had initially spoken to a lovely woman. Her name was Martha Vaughn. She also has sadly since died. And I began to tell her about what I had found and she began to cry on the phone. And I felt quite badly initially. And I said, I'm so sorry. And I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't be sharing this. And she said, no, no, no. My family has been living with this for so long. And it really was a reminder to me about how this history still reverberates um, and how this is still living history, even to this day, for so many people. Mm -hmm. Have you, since the book has come out, have you spoken to any of the people you interviewed for it or people in the uh, Osage Nation? Yeah, so um, I did. And, you know, one of the things for me, the most important thing on book tour was making sure I went back to the Osage Nation. I spent many years um, uh, there visiting often for weeks at a time. And um, I wanted to go back there and present the book. And um, and it was really remarkable and kind of an experience like I never quite had as a writer. Um, I wanted this history to be their history. I could not have uh, their book as much as my book. And I could not have told it without their help. Um, mm. Provided so much information. So they were so generous over the years. Um, and so bringing that back, um, I met with many of the descendants who I'd interviewed. Um, and there was even, um, and, and that was just a, a, an amazing experience. Um, the Osage, there's an area I write about in Grey Horse where they have their sacred dances and they prepared a feast up there for me and presented me with a blanket. And I spoke about the book. So many descendants were there. Um, and so that really was, uh, you know, uh, just a really, for me, rewarding and a reminder of kind of why you do this kind of thing. Um, and what was interesting, too, is that many events I went to, particularly in Oklahoma, descendants would come to the events. I was at an event in Tulsa where there were many descendants of the victims who came, including uh, the descendants of Molly Burkhart, that Osage woman I wrote about who 
the point of view of the first chronicle, her granddaughter came, um, and there was a descendant of one of the killers there. In fact, the person who appeared in that picture, the so-called devil who had been cut out of the photograph, a descendant of him uh, had come to the wow. event, a woman. And um, there was a point where she stood up and expressed remorse about what her family, her uh, the history. Um, and she went over and, uh, and embraced Margie, uh, which I thought was very striking. Um, but again, it's a reminder of how this history is still playing out. Um, you know, descendants of the murderers and the victims in many cases still live in the same neighborhoods uh, in Osage County and their fates are intertwined. And in many ways, that is the story of America. Um, so I saw online today that this book is being considered for a movie. Lost City of Z was turned into a movie that came out very recently, which I haven't seen yet, but I want to see. Um, how does, how, I'm just wondering, how does that work from your point of view? Are you involved at all? Are you happy <laughs> when, to see, to see a movie of, a recreation of a story you've brought to life? What, what is that experience like? Yeah. So, um, you know, the truthful answer is, um, uh, it's obviously a wonderful where people are interested in the material and there's an element of, Happiness about that. Um, I tend to re- keep pretty separate in the sense that I really just focus on my work. Uh, it's hard enough to do the books and to do the articles. And I try to be helpful if people want help and if they have questions. I was lucky enough for the Lost City to see that the project was in the hands of very good people. And so far, it seems like the Killers of the Fire or Moon is in the hands of very capable people. Um, and so... The thing, you know, it's a, you, you keep it separate. You don't really have kind of the kind of authorial control you have when you're working on your own books or your stories. And you kind of accept that as part of the process. The, the good part is that in many cases I'm writing about history that has been lost or undercovered. And especially in a case like the Osage murders, which, um, is something that's been excised from far too much of our conscious, a, a movie can help kind of bring that story back into our history, even in many ways, uh, and reach people in a way that a book always can't. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those that's all the questions I have. I, I guess I'll, I'll just, I'll, you know, whenever I get a new copy of The New Yorker, I page <laughs> through to see if there's a David Grant story in there, uh, because I know I want to read it immediately. Um, can you tell us, are you working on anything right now? Yeah, I, I actually am. I'm in the midst of a New Yorker story. Um, it's uh, uh, uh it's different than um the you know it's not a crime story uh, it's a little more like the lost city of z uh dealing with an explorer um but a more contemporary explorer and um i hope to if i can you know after the book it's hard to gear back up but i'm hoping um i can get a draft done in the next month or so and uh be back in the magazine which would be wonderful okay well i i'm looking forward to that greatly um, Killers of the Flower Moon is the book uh, David thanks so much for taking the time to come on with us and um, everyone should go out and buy it or get it however you want, you want to get it and uh, read this uh, fascinating lost story that you've uncovered thank you so much okay thanks a lot thank you